To save our democracy, we have to make the U.S. government faster, more efficient, and more effective. And we can do that by expanding the power of the executive branch to use fast-track authority to approve all types of legislation, believes Stanford political scientist Terry Moe. Moe, who's the author of President Populism and the Crisis of Democracy, wants Congress to have the power to approve or deny laws through an up or down vote, but not to add amendments or filibuster their passage. The Cato Institute's Gene Healy says that non-libertarians of all political persuasions suffer from a dangerous devotion to the boundless nature of presidential responsibility. Healy, who's the author of The Cult of the Presidency, says that instead of giving the executive branch more legislative authority, presidential powers must be brought back to their constitutional limits. Do U.S. presidents need a fast track, or should their power be sharply curtailed? Terry Moe and Gene Healy went head-to-head -head on this issue in a recent virtual SoHo Forum debate moderated by SoHo Forum director Gene Epstein. Tonight's resolution reads, to make the federal government more effective, presidents should be given fast-track authority to propose bills for all types of legislation that Congress must approve or deny by majority vote and without change. Uh, Terry Moe will be defending the resolution. Uh, Kate Cato Institute VP Gene Healy will be opposing the resolution. And now, uh, again, speaking on behalf of the resolution, Professor Terry Moe, you have 15 minutes. Take it away, Terry. Uh, look, let me start out uh, with the following simple statement. We in the United States, have a government that just doesn't work. It's chronically ineffective and incapable of dealing with the complex, hugely consequential problems of modern times. For example, for decades, it's done a very bad job of dealing with the horribly disruptive effects of globalization and technological change, which have led to job losses, to a hollowing out of manufacturing, to a decimation of many local communities, especially rural communities, to the opioid crisis, and to great financial loss, insecurity, and stress among tens of millions of Americans. We also have an unworkable immigration system that has caused widespread cultural and economic concern. And then there are serious problems of healthcare, pollution, a crumbling infrastructure, and much more, including, needless to say, the pandemic. Well, our government has been highly ineffective at dealing with all of these. The result is not only that our society and our people are worse off, which in itself, needless to say, is hugely important. It's also that ineffective government is literally dangerous to our democracy because it leads to alienation, disaffection, and anger with our system of government as the rise of populism and Donald Trump well demonstrates. This anti-system rage leads to a rejection of our democratic institutions and it threatens to bring our democracy down. The fact is, a democratic government that can't respond to the needs of its citizens and respond effectively cannot survive. This is true everywhere throughout the world and it's true for the United States. We're not special in that regard. So. Why is American government so ineffective? Obviously, many factors are at work, polarization most notably, but the fundamentals of this problem can be traced back to the Constitution itself. I know this sounds like sacrilege, we all love the Constitution, and it's truly a watershed achievement in the entire history of human self-governance. But we need to keep in mind that the framers wrote the Constitution more than 230 years ago. And while the Bill of Rights is timeless, the specific architecture of government laid out in the rest of the Constitution is a different matter. The framers designed a government for their times, for a simple, isolated, agrarian society of less than 4 million people, most of them farmers, Government was not expected to do much then, and the framers purposely designed a government that couldn't do much. They designed a government that 
separated authority across the branches. They filled it with checks and balances and veto points that made coherent policy action exceedingly difficult to the point that it led often to outright dysfunction, especially in modern times. The framers put Congress right at the center of lawmaking, and Congress is right at the center of the dysfunction. As a decision maker, Congress is just inexcusably bad and utterly incapable of taking effective action on behalf of the nation. Most observers point the finger at polarization and they say that, you know, if we could just move to a more moderate bipartisan brand of politics, Congress could get back to the good old days when it did a fine job of making public policy and all would be good. But all would not be good because the good old days were actually not good. The brute fact is, with some exceptions, like the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and some others, Congress has never, throughout our long history, been capable of crafting effective policy responses to the nation's problems. For documentation, take a look at Peter Schuck's book, Why Government Fails So Often, which provides an encyclopedic source of well-documented evidence on our government's persistent history of ineffective policies. Polarization has made a bad situation worse in recent times, but it is not the underlying cause of Congress's core inadequacies. Those inadequacies are baked into the institution. Congress is an ineffective policymaker because it's wired to be that way by the Constitution, whose design ensures that legislators are electorally tied to their districts and states and highly responsive to the constituencies and special interests that get them reelected. Congress is not wired to solve national problems in the national interest. It's wired to allow hundreds of parochial legislators to promote their own political welfare through special interest politics, and that's what they do. Because of polarization and because of all the veto points and collective action problems, Congress has often been just gridlocked, unable to act at all. But when Congress has been able to act, its lawmaking process has typically led to cobbled together policy concoctions that are crafted on purely political grounds to get disparate legislators representing very different special and local interests on board, not to provide coherent, intellectually well-justified policies that effectively address the nation's problems. The point for them is to patch together something, anything, with enough votes to pass, not to solve problems in the best possible way. So look no further than US tax policy, which is not a policy at all, but a grotesque conglomeration of thousands of special interest favors and loopholes. Or witness the ways in which insurance companies, hospitals, drug companies, and other vested interests profoundly shaped the Affordable Care Act turning it into something that no one would have designed that way if they wanted a cost-efficient, well-working system. This approach to government may have been fine for the late 1700s, but that era is long gone and it's not coming back. What we need is a government that is up to the enormous challenges thrust upon it by the modern world. What we have is a government designed for a primitive world nothing like our own. It shouldn't come as a shock that this antiquated government, which was not designed for our world, is simply ill-equipped to deal with it and does a bad job. So what can we do? Well, the U.S. is clearly not going to shift to some other form of government or even embrace radical changes of the government that we have. That being so, a practical strategy is to pursue smaller changes that leave our system pretty much as it is, but promise big payoffs for effective government. So here's one approach that we think makes good sense. With Congress, the prime source of dysfunction, we should move Congress and all its pathologies from the very center of the legislative process, and we should extend much, a much more central role to presidents. Why presidents? Because their wiring is very different from Congress's and actually propels them to be the champions of effective government. Historically, Trump aside, 
This has been true regardless of whether presidents are liberals or conservatives, Democrats or Republicans, seekers of big government or small government. Unlike most legis legislators, excuse me, presidents think in national terms about national problems and their overriding concern for their historical legacies for being great drives them to seek durable solutions to pressing national problems. Needless to say, presidents aren't always successful or right. And conservative presidents would seek very different policy solutions than liberal presidents. But all presidents aspire to be the nation's problem solvers in chief. And if control of legislation can be shifted partly, not wholly, partly in their direction and away from Congress, the prospects for effective government will be much improved. A simple way to do this is through legislation or a constitutional amendment, if that were possible, although legislation could do it, that grants president fast track authority in the lawmaking process. The US has more than 45 years of positive experience with fast track authority in international trade. We've been doing it for decades going all the way back to the Trade Act of 1974. That same model would simply be applied to all legislation or, barring that, to as many important types of issues as possible, including nominations. Under Fast Track, presidents would craft policy proposals, which are likely to be far more coherent, well-integrated, intellectually well-justified, and effective than anything Congress would typically come up with. Congress would then be required to vote up or down on those policy proposals without changing them. And it would be required to vote within a specified period of time, say 90 days, and on a majoritarian basis. So there could be no delays, there could be no filibusters, and no amendments filling the legislation with new earmarks, loopholes, and special interest provisions. Even with fast track in place, though, Congress would still retain the authority to pass laws on its own if it wanted to, and presidents would still retain the authority to veto those laws. All right, so critics might say that fast track would make the president a dictator. Well, it wouldn't. Both houses of Congress would still need to give their separate consent before any proposal becomes law. Policy would be a three-way decision, not a presidential decision and the court system and separation of powers would remain intact along with the Bill of Rights. Moreover, to ensure passage of his policy proposals, presidents would have strong incentives to get lots of input from members of Congress <clears throat> while working up a bill and to engage in whatever compromises are needed in order to gain sufficient support. In addition, Congress could send the proposals out to its committees to get opinion and advice. So again, presidents would hardly be a dictator. I should add that in giving presidents new agenda powers, that's what these are, <clears throat> Fast Track only deals with legislation. It adds nothing to the president's unilateral powers, which are the powers that we really need to fear. Indeed, a big reason presidents have favored executive orders and other unilateral actions is that with Congress such a disaster, the legislative process is all but unavailable for solving problems. Under fast track, presidents, Five minutes, would, Terry. Five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. presidents would seek out legislation more and unilateral action less. And this would be a big plus for our democracy. Consider immigration, for example. President Bush submitted immigration reforms to Congress in 2005 and 2006. And President Obama submitted another in 2013. All of these bills had majority support in Congress. The votes were clearly there. Yet the first two lost on filibusters in the Senate, and the third failed because Speaker John Boehner refused to even bring it up for a vote in the House. The result, no reform, a festering immigration problem, and executive actions by Obama on DACA and other shifts in policy that have caused much consternation on the political right. With fast track, the nation would have passed a comprehensive bipartisan immigration law many years ago. And there would have been no, uh, less reason or no reason for Obama to take executive action. 
Now consider a very different example. Suppose fast track were applied as we think it should be to all nominations. Obviously, we need these key positions to be filled and quickly in government agencies and in the courts um, if our government is to do its work and do it well. For decades, however, we've had a very serious problem with presidential nominations being endlessly delayed in the Senate and many are never even acted upon. Under fast track, every nomination would receive a majority rule vote by the Senate, up or down, within 90 days. There would be no delays and no strategy of delay. The most reasonable expectation is the great majority of these nominations would just go through, and the courts and agencies would be more quickly and fully staffed and better able to do their jobs. So look, there's much more to say, of course, but here's the bottom line. In the United States, the most fundamental challenge we face is that our government is profoundly ineffective. When problems don't get solved, our society suffers from poor health care, from rising sea levels, from decaying communities, from crumbling infrastructure, from out of control immigration, and more, deeply affecting our quality of life. But that's not all. Because when a demo democratic government can't meet the needs of its people, the people become alienated, angry, and anti-system, as tens of millions of Americans are and have been for some years now. Their political power is very real, and it threatens to bring our democracy down. This is not an academic matter. We need to do something. We need to make our government more effective so that it can meet the needs of its people. This doesn't require, I should emphasize, a turn to big, bureaucratic, top-down government. Some progressives, of course, may choose exactly that path, but conservatives can pursue effective government by embracing policy approaches that, through well-crafted governmental designs, harness the power of markets and incentives to address the nation's most pressing problems. Carbon taxes, for example, to deal with pollution and climate change, or market-based solutions to provide affordable health care or rebuild rural communities. Whatever the approach, we all have a stake in creating a government that works and in saving our democracy. Fast track is one step in the right direction. It's a small, familiar, well-tested, non-threatening reform that stands to have major payoffs. It's the mouse that roars. It would help to streamline a grossly unworkable legislative process and giving us a government that through lawmaking, not unilateral action, lawmaking, can deal more effectively with the modern world and do a better job meeting the needs of our citizens. If we don't take action to give Americans a better government, one minute, headed, one minute, go ahead. Yeah. We're headed for a train wreck. Our democracy really is on the line. We do need to do something. And fast track is a safe, reasonable reform that deserves our support. Thank you. Thank you, Terry Mo. Uh, and uh, now, Taking uh, the negative on that resolution, 17 and a half, and a half minutes for you, Gene Healy. Uh, take it away, Gene Healy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, my fellow Gene. And thanks to all of you for tuning in tonight. Uh, St. Patrick's Day isn't what it used to be in the, now that we're in the era of social distancing. Uh, but Hopefully this will be more nutritious than guzzling green beer, and you'll probably feel better in the morning. Uh, I have to admit it is difficult for me uh, to imagine gazing out at the hellscape of American politics and saying to myself, you know what this country needs? A good, it's a good dose of presidential empowerment. Uh, after all, the the what we already called the most powerful office in the world has become dramatically more powerful in recent decades. Uh, you know, you look at the dragnet secret surveillance programs, global drone warfare, and the pen and phone governance of the Bush Obama years. And then you look at the new weapons that Donald Trump has added to the presidential arsenal, uh, like the ability to use national emergency declarations to do an end run around Congress in a budget fight, or the uh, notion that you can order up drone strikes on senior government figures of countries that we're not legally at war with. The whole experience has been exhausting and frequently terrifying. 
uh, what with the president threatening war crimes over Twitter, and even on one occasion getting into this weird Freudian spat with Kim Jong Un over the size of his. Uh, well, well, it went like this. Quote, I, too, have a nuclear button, but it is a much bigger and more powerful one than Kim's, and my button works. All in all, uh, the Trump years really should have served as a, sort of a scared straight program for well-meaning progressives who get dewy-eyed about the promise of presidential activism. But it's like the the chain gang warden says to Paul Newman in Cool Hand Luke, some men you just can't reach. Uh, uh, Professor Mo tells us in his book that it's important not to be fixated on Trump and the fear of presidential power. He laments that the Trump presidency has actually scared many people into thinking that the presidency needs to be straitjacketed which is an interesting choice of metaphor given the multiple times over the past four years when we had, had to genuinely wonder whether we'd handed over the machinery of federal law enforcement and the nuclear codes to a nutcase. Still, he says, if we bind POTUS down too much, we'll miss out on the enormous promise that presidents can offer as champions of effective government. And the proposed constitutional amendment, it's a, in the book, it's offered as a constitutional amendment. Uh, perhaps some parts of it could be done legislatively, but uh, in both Relic and the newer book, uh, they talk about an Article 5 convention uh, in order to get this done. Uh, the fast track proposal is supposed to help realize this uh, promise uh, of the presidency. Uh, under it, as he told you, the president writes his preferred bill. He gets a fast track vote on that bill and congressmen uh, can either rubber stamp it or essentially veto it. They don't get to get their grubby little thumbprints all over it. Well, in the interests of a lively debate, I really ought to be telling you that this, um, I'm going to call it the Mo Amendment is a doomsday device that if activated will lay waste to our Republican form of government uh, and we'll all be left to scrabble across the post-apocalyptic wasteland, uh, you know, searching for bullets and toilet paper. But I'm not gonna do that uh, because I really don't think that it wouldn't be honest. Uh, the fact is that the proposal doesn't absolutely scare the hell out of me in every respect. I think uh, he, what he just said, about it doesn't make the president a dictator, I think that's largely accurate. Uh, so I, I don't want to paint a darker picture than I have to. I just think it's a lousy idea. Uh, I can imagine circumstances in which it's potentially quite dangerous. Uh, I think that in the best case, it rests on a sunny, almost Panglossian uh, picture of presidential motivations. And I think that in the unlikely event of its implementation, it would probably make some of the problems uh, he talks about, partisan animosity and tribalism, uh, a good deal worse. Uh, let's start with uh, where I can picture it going very wrong. Uh, in chapter four of the latest book, uh, the, the authors uh, tell us that one of the problems, one of the problems that it will help ameliorate uh, is the irresponsible way that we tend to drift into war these days. Uh, if the Mo Amendment was in the Mo Howell Amendment, if you like, was in force, then when the president wants to take military action, he can put his preferred war authorization in front of Congress and force them to stand and be counted. I think it'd be a good thing if Congress was forced to stand stand and be counted in uh, military matters far more often. Uh, but most of you are probably familiar with the 2001 Authorization for the Use of Military Force, or AUMF, that Congress passed three days after 9-11. Uh, it gave the president the power to, quote, use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons. He determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided, 
the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001. In other words, go get the guys who did uh, who did uh, 9-11 and anyone connected with them. Three presidents in a row have stretched that law into an all-purpose justification for uh, two decades of low-level war in at least half a dozen countries at any given time. And that's entirely Congress's fault, according to, to Mo and Howell. Uh, they write that the language could not have been broader. Well, of course it could. And it would have if this amendment had been in place. Here, for example, is some broader language. The president is authorized to use military force to deter and preempt any future acts of terrorism or aggression against the United States. That's the language that the Bush, the Bush administration put on the table in negotiations with Congress right after 9-11. And talk about a blank check. Uh, preempt any future acts of aggression. This draft AUMF that the Bush team put together would have been a license for any future president to unleash fire and fury against North Korea, Iran, or basically any country that the president decides is looking at us funny. But if President Bush had had the power three days after 9-11 to force an up or down vote on that language, do you really think that Congress would have voted it down with ground zero still smoldering? I don't. Perhaps I'm concentrating too much on the fear side of the equation, but there's also the uh, the promise side of the equation, the promise of presidential power. Uh, that idea is, uh, as uh, Professor Mo just uh, unveiled to you, it's rooted in the, the, the theory that the presidents and Congress critters are wired differently, thanks to the nature of their respective offices. The president is elected by the whole country, means he has to take a larger view, be more public spirited, uh, look at the national interest as a whole. Congressmen basically just want to bring home the bacon. Uh, on top of that, presidents are, he says, are obsessed with their legacies, which is true. Uh, they play to the ages. They want future generations to love them. Uh, and uh, the part that I quibble with is the idea that solving big national problems is, quote, their ticket to historical adulation, the way in which they become that, that, that and the reason that they routinely aspire to be problems, the nation's problem solvers in chief. They alone can fix it. I think this is a bit of a caricature, or more than a bit. There's, of course, a wide body of evidence showing that, like uh, any swamp dwelling Congress critter, presidents tend to play pork barrel politics with federal aid. They tend to direct it where it helps them politically to swing states and areas where their part partisan base is con concentrated. Stafford Act in the area of disaster relief gives them a great deal of authority to do that. Uh, so does it shock you to hear that disaster declarations spike in election years and that battleground states tend to get a lot more love? Probably not. Um, would it scandalize you to, to learn that uh, presidents uh, well before Donald Trump uh, used their unilateral powers over trade to deliver protectionist payoffs to swing state industries? A uh, good example is in the run up to the 2004 election when George W. Bush hiked steel tariffs screwing consumers nationwide in order to give himself a boost in states like Ohio and West Virginia. And it worked. Um, so I, 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 this uh, vast dichotomy between the parochialism of congressmen and the public spiritedness of presidents, I think, is exaggerated. And as for this idea that uh, solving big, genuine national problems is the surefire ticket to the esteem of historians, uh, I have to borrow a Joe Bidenism. Come on, man. Uh, you know who is a real problem solver in chief? Jimmy Carter. And don't laugh. Uh, Jimmy Carter bit the bullet on inflation, putting Paul Volcker in a, at the Fed. He led a wave of transportation deregulation that uh, made air travel accessible to average Americans, 
and uh, made shipping cheaper, faster, enabled just-in-time inventory. It, when you think about these pampered yuppies, really have Jimmy, Jimmy Carter to thank every time UPS drops off a Peloton bike or a pandemic care package with sourdough starter. But do they thank him? No, of course not. All anyone, all Americans can remember about the Carter presidency is the misery index, the hostage crisis, and that stupid cardigan sweater. Jimmy doesn't get any historical adulation either for having been a good problem solver. Uh, the scholars who, who rank the presidents uh, make him one of history's losers. He's uh, bottom half of the class, uh, number 26 on average, uh, just ahead of Richard Nixon, behind uh, uh, the so-called great presidents like Woodrow Wilson, who took us into an unnecessary war and uh, mounted one of the worst civil liberties crackdowns in U.S. history, and James K. Polk, uh, who, according to the most recent C-SPAN presidential historian survey, quote, ranks highly for his crisis leadership, uh, which is one way of one way that you could describe ginning up a war with Mexico to steal California. Five crisis. minutes. Five minutes. Sure. Yeah. Oh, God, I got to speed up then. Um, maybe Jimmy Carter should have started a war. Uh, uh, there there uh, it turns out to be a, uh, uh, a, a in a regression analysis published by David Henderson, a uh, fairly strong correlation between combat deaths under U.S. presidents and their historical ranking. Um, none of uh, what you learn about uh, how legacies are graded uh, is really going to incentivize a president to uh, uh, say get out ahead of the threat of antibiotic resistance or stand up a good asteroid defense. Uh, moreover, the, the, the fast track, the track amendment is supposed to be a fire break against the menacing rise of populism. Uh, we've got, as he told you, a paralyzed government overburdened with veto, veto points. And uh, it's this ineffectiveness that gave rise to uh, Donald Trump in the first place. Is it, or does this smack a little bit of what the psychologists call projection? It's not as if the 21st century has been one long woeful tale of government paralysis. Uh, we have a number of examples where Congress and the president got together to do, get the big things done in accordance with the president's vision. Uh, the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, the Patriot Act, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, after the financial collapse at the end of that decade, uh, stimulus package and the TARP bailout plan. You'll notice that a lot of these big ticket items feature heavily in populist complaints. Uh, before the Tea Party drifted Trumpward, it got started as a populist backlash against bank bailouts. Uh, with the exception of immigration policy, for the most part, actual populists aren't complaining that elites sit there paralyzed while national crises worsen. They're mad about what those morons did. Um, it is also a little strange that uh, to, to want to cool populist tempers with a uh, proposal modeled on the fast track process that gave us NAFTA and the WTO. Um, like Professor Mo, I happen to think globalization has been on balance an enormous boom, but nationalist conservatives loathe these fast track uh, trade agreements and blame them for uh, screwing the American worker and causing deaths of despair. But Professor Mo says they're at least partly right. Finally, in the unlikely event that uh, we had an Article 5 convention, which we've never done in our history, and this amendment emerged from the process and got ratified, my strong suspicion is it would make the problem of red-blue tr tribalism even worse. Uh, one of the reasons the presidency has been, been one of our biggest fault lines of polarization is the fact that the president increasingly has power to shape, reshape vast swaths of American life, shape what our health insurance covers, what sports your kids can play, whether or not you're on the hook for your student loans. Uh, he has the power to launch a trade war from his couch or stumble into a shooting war in the Middle East. You can bet when the stakes are that high, we're gonna, be, we're gonna fight about it bitterly. The Mo Amendment, with its new agenda setting powers for the president, raises the stakes even higher. It makes the presidency an even bigger prize in a zero-sum, winner-take-all partisan death match. 
And if what we're worried about is the rise of populist demagogues, we should be heading in the opposite direction, working to limit the damage that they can do when they take office, reigning in emergency powers, war powers, trade authorities, uh, pen in the phone. Uh, what we should be aiming at One minute, go is making the president safe from populism and safe for democracy. None of that is easy to do, but none of it requires a constitutional amendment and none of it pre presents the risks entailed in Professor Moe's proposal. Just say no to his amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Uh, Terry, I guess you don't mind it being called the Moe Amendment. And uh, Terry, Terry Moe, you've got, uh, we're keeping to the, uh, to the, uh, to the lengthened uh, schedule indeed, uh, you have uh, five minutes uh, for rebuttal. Uh, take it away, Terry. Well, um... From my standpoint, it's as though Gene just took a giant plate of linguine and threw it against the wall, you know, I mean, to see what would stick. Um, uh, there wasn't, uh, from my standpoint, any coherent, logically linear kind of argument being made here. There were just a bunch of different uh, points being made that weren't entirely connected to one another. So dealing with that kind of melange is, not so easy. Um, so look, let me just make a couple of points here. Um, uh, one is that uh, it's important to think about both the promise and the fear of, of presidential leadership and presidential power. And the fact is that presidents have great promise in promoting effective government because we have a government that doesn't work. It's all divided up. It's all fragmented. And Congress at the center is filled with 535 people running in different directions and, and responding to different interests. The thing is a mess. It's an institutional travesty. And so we need a president to provide guidance and leadership. And um, it's our only hope for effective government. So the idea that, okay, Trump was president. Trump was scary, you know, uh, acting unilaterally, undermining um, uh, the rule of law, attacking our democratic institutions, uh, and much worse, uh, for four years. And so people hear, well, we should give presidents this additional power or authority in, uh, fast track. People hear that and they go, are you kidding? You know, what we have to do is we, the lesson of the, the Trump years is to tie presidents up in knots. That's what we have to do. Okay. You tie presidents up in knots. And then our government will be even less efficient, right? We need an effective government when we can't get it if we tie presidents up in knots, okay? So um, uh, we have to then recognize that there's two sides of this. The other side is the fear side. We have reason to fear presidential power, but what we can do is constrain presidents in other ways, right? We can have a fast track uh, uh, model of decision-making that empowers presidents to make the government more effective and takes advantage of that aspect of what presidents have to offer. But then we can also say, insulate the Department of Justice and the intelligence agencies from direct presidential control by various means. Trump came very close to using those powerful agencies in very, very dangerous ways. Um, we can take steps to drastically limit the number of presidential appointees. We can eliminate through constitutional amendment the pardon power. There's never any justification for that thing. Um, we can pass legislation that does away with conflicts of interest by presidents. The laws we have now are a travesty. We can pass legislation that really restricts the president's ability to use national emergency to take unilateral actions, and so on. So we can constrain presidents and protect ourselves, but at the same time, we can empower presidents in the legislative process to make the legislative process, which is a travesty, work better. So that's the logic of that. Um, just the thing about legacy, I, I think Presidents are obviously motivated by legacy. They all want to be great. They think about it all the time. 
And this drives them to want to do good things for the country. One minute. That's a very, minute. Yeah. That's a very good thing. And this article about, you know, the, what Gene was saying about Jimmy Carter just doesn't ring true. I mean, Jimmy Carter did actually a lot of good things for this country. Um, but he was burdened by a terrible economy. One of the worst ever in this country, you know, with huge unemployment and through the roof inflation. And then the Iranians took our hostages. Okay, it was, he was done, right? And that was part of his legacy too. So it's not as though he didn't accomplish things. And it's also not that he wasn't trying because he was. And the important thing is that all presidents want to try hard to achieve important things for the country. And that makes them different from Congress because they're thinking about cotton and soybeans, and they're not thinking about the kinds of things that presidents are thinking about. Perfect timing, uh, five minutes. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, five minutes of uh, Linguini from you, Gene. <laughs> well, I think in the, uh, the, the Linguini storm, uh, Professor Mo uh, completely missed my point about Jimmy Carter or uh, couldn't believe that I wasn't being sarcastic. In fact, Jimmy Carter was a problem solver. I think he did great things in deregulating the transport sector. I think he, I think Ronald Reagan gets a good bit of the credit uh, for some of the deregulation that happened under uh, Jimmy Carter. I do think that it would be uh, w without uh, the wave of reform that he initi w initiated, without the problem that he very much helped solve, I think that, uh, you know, I think it would be the few parts of American society that, that worked well uh, in this pandemic, uh, including uh, uh, fast shipping of various goods would not have been possible. So I was not joking about Carter. The man solved a couple of problems uh, and gets no uh, appreciation from the people who fill out presidential scorecards for it. Uh, if you look at uh, the presidential scorecards, you will find that in the bottom 10, there are no war presidents. The top 10 are larded with them. Uh, and uh, in no way would uh, it, it's absolutely true that, that presidents care about their legacies, but what uh, the uh, people who are filling out the report cards are telling them is that being an imperial president who makes a lot of noise, breaks things, uh, and does, uh, does big things uh, is certainly much more, improbable, more, more important than the slow boring of hard boards and solving genuine national problems. That, that's my point. It's a bit of a romanticized uh, view of how presidents are motivated. Uh, Bill Clinton used to complain to Dick Morris about how hard it was being president when we didn't have a, a, an enemy to fight. He used to say, I, enjoy, I, I envy JFK, uh, you know, having an enemy that you can get people to do, when, do things when they're not threatened uh, is harder. Um, I don't know what else I have. I, I think uh, uh, the, the proposal uh, would make some things worse, a few minor things better, and uh, mostly exacerbate the very problems that Howell and Mo uh, identify. All right. Okay. You took um, uh, just uh, less than three minutes of your time, Gene. And, uh, you know, that can't be uh, gotten back. That's lost forever. Uh, we <laughs> now turn to uh, the Q&A portion of the evening, and uh, we give uh, an opportunity to uh, to Gene Healy to ask a question of Terry Mo. Terry Mo, the opportunity to ask a question of Gene Healy. Gene, first of all, do you want to exercise that option at this moment? You can exercise it later if you want. Uh, one of the intriguing things I I I thought about the book, and one of the things that made me uh, think about the proposal a little more, um, is I do think it's true that uh, gridlock while it's not an argument for more presidential power, it certainly uh, drives presidents 
uh, to strike out on their own. I think that's exactly what happened uh, with the Obama uh, directives, uh, you know, implementing large parts of the DREAM Act. But under this proposal, don't you give everyone two bites at the apple? For example, like, uh, so if a president, uh, the president can go uh, the fast track route, he, he can put a legislative proposal on the table. And if it, uh, you know, if it passes, good. Uh, we're all united behind it. Uh, if it fails, though, he's in a worse position for unilateral action uh, because now he is uh, in the uh, for the executive power law geeks. He's in he's not no longer in the Jackson zone of twilight. He's Congress has considered this, voted it down. So he's taken the ability to do it unilaterally under current doctrine off the table. Why wouldn't the president just so if if Joe Biden decides that uh, he agrees with the Elizabeth Warren's uh, idea that he can just forgive up to fifty thousand dollars in student loan debt uh, per person, he would only put that on the table, right? If he if he thought he was going to win the vote, right? Otherwise, he would just do it unilaterally, and there would be no argument. Uh, his argument would be just as good as it was before. Uh, this amendment passed. So why doesn't this just add more gamesmanship uh, to and more diffusion of responsibility uh, to an already diffuse and frustrating process? Well, there's, al there's always going to be gamesmanship, right? You know that. And I think presidents are going to have to figure out what their options are and uh, uh, make their moves accordingly. So uh, they're going to do the best they can to get proposals through Congress by uh, mobilizing support as best they can within Congress, because legislation is better than an executive order. It's permanent, right? And they would rather do that uh, than issue an executive order, right? I think you're right. They don't want to uh, initiate legislation have Cong and then have Congress voted down. Right. But they're not stupid. Right. So they can look ahead. They can count noses and uh, they just have to figure out what they're going to go with and what they're not going to go with. But fast track gives them legislative options that they don't have now. It gives them opportunities to make public policy by passing legislation. And I think one of the things that is really um, made our democracy so difficult um, uh, over the past number of decades is that the legislative process doesn't work and presidents can't rely on it. And so they have to issue these executive orders. Well, you know, they're a, a pale reflection of, of real legislation. You know, it's not optimal for the system as a whole. We don't want that. We want legislation, but legislation can't happen most of the time. Right. So what I would do is just turn this back and say, look, man, if you don't have fast track, what do you have? Just the system as it exists. Then what? Are you happy with that? All right. Look, look uh, I don't uh, I don't have a, uh, a, a five point plan to solve executive uh, to solve uh, to, to deliver effective government in the areas where I think effective government is needed. Um, I don't have to, to uh, be able to conclude that your plan doesn't really do it. Uh, I think, uh, look, I agree that uh, I think the president should get an up or down vote on uh, all judicial nominations, certainly all executive branch nominations. Um, I think we, we're going to get closer to that. Um, I don't know why I should conclude from that that... Uh, the president should get to write his own war authorizations and ram them through uh, Congress uh, that can either rubber stamp them or send them back uh, in a crisis atmosphere. Uh, I don't I don't see that as making uh, uh, any huge improvements on, on what we've got now. Uh, I also furthermore don't see um, many of the, the large 21st century initiatives where Congress and the president moved in lockstep and that have been disasters. I don't really see that they've been uh, uh, 
maybe a, Obamacare might be, a, you know, you may have a point there, but most of them, I don't, I don't see it as congressional parochialism, uh, screwing up the president's uh, public spirited vision. Uh, I think uh, people got together and, and did stupid things in a big way. And uh, I'm not sure I want to grease the tracks for more of that to happen. Um, I have a, a question uh, for you, uh, Terry. Uh, Gene Healy said that uh, that the fast track might be better in minor ways. Uh, do you see how, uh, on your side, do you see how fast track authority may be worse in minor ways? And uh, and if so, could you address the minor ways in which it make, might make matters worse? Or do you see no potential for, to make matters worse in any way? Take it away, Terry. Do you have an answer to that question? Yeah, yeah, my answer is no. I, okay. I, I don't see any ways in, in which uh, uh, fast track would be worse than what we have now. What we have now is, is a process that simply doesn't work. Gene Healy, then on your side, you said it could be better in minor ways. So why don't you speak on behalf of it in minor ways, uh, at least for a, a minute or two? In what way sure. might it be better? Yeah, Sure. Uh, I, I will say that I, I led before the Linguini onslaught with a big example in the 2001 AUMF and the original Bush administration language in which it could have been worse in a major way. Um, but no, I, as I said, I think... Uh, uh, you know, I think Merrick Garland should have gotten an up or down vote. I don't think uh, uh, he, I don't care which party's doing it. I think the uh, the president, when he's trying to staff an administration, should get an up or down vote. And I also think Terry is right. Um, you know, years ago, I probably would have said all oh, gridlock is good, uh, but I I think Terry is right that uh, that it incentivizes uh, uh, presidents who have, there's a lot of play in the joints, a lot of unilateral power they can, they can claim. There's a lot of flexibility in statutes because Congress writes them so broadly that uh, it doesn't end with gridlock. So I, I think uh, Barack Obama was uh, reluctantly driven into making immigration policy with the stroke of a pen, which is yeah. not ideal. And I think that... Uh, uh, Joe Biden will be under similar pressures uh, in a 50-50 right. uh, Senate. So I do think something that, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's the case that gridlock is always good. And I think that uh, there is a case to be made that uh, something along the lines of uh, what Ter what Mo and Howell propose, uh, some elements of it uh, would cut down on that incentive uh, for the president to strike out on his own and just make law by executive fiat. I don't think it would solve most of the problems, however. Do you want to come in on that, Terry, or should we get to the next question? Yeah. Well, I, I do think that we need to be comparing um, these discussions about possible reforms with the status quo. The status quo is a complete institutional mess. And we are in a society that is filled with very, very debilitating, consequential problems that are burying people and are making people really angry and really disaffected from our country and from our democracy. And while people sit here twiddling their, sum, their thumbs and and sort of glorifying our constitutional system and glorifying Congress as though, gee, you know, if Congress could just get it together, you know, and if they could just act in a bipartisan way, we'd be able to fix these things. And all of that is wrong. You know, it's the whole institutional system that doesn't work. And meantime, we're going down. This is a very serious crisis of democracy that we're in right now. Even though Trump is out of office, it was worse when Trump was in office. If, if he had won a second term, I have little doubt we would have gone down. Now would you out. want him to have the fast track amendment if he had won a second term? I think in general, um, we should have fast track. Just like I think in general, there should be no filibuster. No, I think we need to take this system, which has so many obstacles to action, 
and get rid of most of those obstacles and have a much more majoritarian democratic system so that elections matter. Right. And so I, this is not a Republican or Democratic thing. Sort of ingenious uh, thought on the part of uh, a person in the chat room uh, implying that maybe this whole idea could be neutralized, uh, uh, which reads, couldn't Congress simply vote down the president's fast track uh, bill and then propose their own version to the normal legislative process? Well, why wouldn't that blunt the worst of Gene Healy's concerns about increased presidential power, or actually, of course, uh, on uh, Terry Moe's side, if, uh, if Congress did that as a matter of course, every time the president comes up with a fast track bill, they just uh, vote it down and write their own, if they're uh, depending on who's in charge, uh, wouldn't that sort of blunt uh, Terry's idea to begin with? But uh, Gene Healy, do you wanna address that particular <laughs> idea, that scenario, and then I'll give it to Terry. Yeah, that's another thing that uh, it's a good question. It's another thing that uh, occurred to me as I was reading the book. Uh, I, you know, I, I went back and forth between would this be a disaster? Or would it not matter at all? And I think I came at, at it as uh, it would matter in certain circumstances, particularly under uh, periods of unified government, uh, particularly during crisis, uh, you know, post Pearl Harbor, post 9-11 moments, I think it'd be especially dangerous. But yeah, there's a, uh, uh, so I, in an earlier question, I thought I suggested that the president can have his choice as to uh, if I think I can win the vote, if I got the right whip count, uh, then I can do this legislatively and it'll have more staying power. Certainly Obama would have preferred to do that with immigration reform. Um, but on the flip side, yeah, uh, as the questioner points out, um, you know, Congress, if it's not a crisis situation, might be able to, uh, and if they're not lockstep with the president, they're not co-partisans, it's divided government, uh, put in all their parochial uh, sausage pieces that they wanted anyway, uh, you know, by just voting down the president's bill and, uh, you know, passing their own bill. I, I think, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think that's a possibility for sure. Uh, do you want maybe to address, Terry has an answer to that. Terry Mo, do you want to address that question and uh, Gene Healy's answer? Terry. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Look, um, in the limits, it's feasible that Congress could just vote no. Right? Like every time the president proposes something, Congress could vote no. And then Congress could uh, go back uh, and uh, devise its own legislation, right? Uh, instead, uh, which the president could, of course, veto, right? Uh, so that could happen. But I think um, the immigration examples I just gave are good ones, right? So here you have these incendiary issues. And nonetheless, they were able to come up with these packages that had enough votes to pass in both the House and the Senate, thanks to votes by Democrats and Republicans, but the leadership wouldn't allow them to pass. So they died, two of them, on filibusters in the Senate, one of them because John Boehner wouldn't even let people vote on them in the House. If you took away that agenda control, we would have had immigration, a new immigration law. Right. And that kind of thing can happen a lot. And anybody in political science who studies agenda control will tell you that the agenda controller has a great deal of control in crafting proposals that will win support from a legislative body. Now, that doesn't mean that they're always going to be successful, but the agenda control is in a real position of power because they're able to manipulate the elements of the proposal, taking into account what kind of support they can get from different alternatives so that they can come up with one with sufficient support to pass, right? So this idea, oh, hey, Congress could just vote no all the time. Okay, that's not what you would expect based on hundreds of studies that have been uh, based on exactly this kind of situation. 
Cherry Mo, I'm getting a number of questions and concerns about an issue that Gene Healy did raise having to do with war powers of the presidency. Uh, and uh, a uh, few of them have picked up on Gene Healy's concern that had there been fast track in 01, a very broad language that the Bush administration wanted to apply could have been voted by Congress and there might have been hell to pay, arguably. Uh, are you uh, concerned uh, more broadly in any way about uh, the war powers of the presidency now? Do you see any way in which fast track might worsen that situation. Uh, is there anything that you want to say addressing that concern? Well, two things. Uh, one, in my view, uh, fast track can be applied to some issues and not others, right? I mean, in the limit, they could be applied to all issues. That doesn't have to be the case. Secondly, um, presidents are almost unconstrained in exercising war powers. Right. I, I mean, I don't like that, but I think I think that they are uh, highly unconstrained. And uh, George Bush was, you know, in uh, starting those wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq, you know, and they go through the motions of, you know, consulting and taking votes and stuff like that. But basically, the president is the man, you know, and that's that's what. Um, the theory of the unitary executive is all about. And that's why the Office of Legal Counsel is staffed by these people who believe in the theory of the unitary executive because they come up with legal justifications for why the president can do whatever he wants to do. Um, so in my view, it's important for those kinds of things to change. And so for me, this is not really a fast track issue so much as it is an issue of the president's unilateral powers in foreign affairs and national security, because I think they go well beyond uh, um, what is good for a democracy, a well-functioning democracy. Yeah, well, the question also picked up on the very point about legacy, which which was Gene Healy's point that yeah. that presidents seem to be ranked high if they fought wars. And uh, but then you are saying that you share that concern, and you are saying then that you would do something about it. Is there something that you would do about it that you'd like to put forward? You know, I, I, this brings up constitutional issues that haven't been resolved, right? Like the the War Powers Act was, I think, a, a good idea. I, um, but it's also an idea that every president has declared unconstitutional and it's never been resolved by the Supreme Court, right? So this was an attempt to rein in presidents. And I think, I think Congress needs to get more serious about reining presidents in when it comes to going to war. It's like, they just have to say, look, we've had it, you know, and, and we need to take steps that will actually constrain presidents when it comes to war making powers. Do, so do then you run, you run into the Supreme Court, right? Because it's unclear where the Supreme Court will stand on this. He's the commander in chief um, and all the rest. Do you, uh, again, uh, to, to flag you further only because we're getting a lot of questions. Uh, do you then perceive that if uh, your amendment were passed, you know, next week, that uh -huh. it could in this vacuum that you speak of, uh, worsen uh, the, uh, the, the already, as you indicate, uh, sorry situation with respect to presidents bringing us to war? Would it worsen it in any way? Do you, do you have that concern? Well, in principle, it, it, it could. But um, really, again, what's happening is you're streamlining the process uh, so that the president has to take a proposal to the Senate and to the House. And the members of the Senate and the House have to vote. Right? But he and doesn't so, have to oh. in war. Okay, oh, well, all right. Just, we're, may, talking may about I, fat, we're talking about fast track here. Right, but... Uh, okay, uh, Terry, you, Terry, you finished sorry. your response for the moment. I was going to give you ample opportunity to address... Oh, sorry about that. of, That's okay, Gene. Uh, Terry, have you finished your remarks for the moment? Yeah, I, I'll just try to clear this up a little bit. Um, because there are times when presidents go to Congress to get authorization, right, for the things that they're going to do or that they have already started doing 
right? Um, and then fast track still requires that the Senate has to vote yes and the House has to vote yes, you know? So those are good things, you know, and they're potential constraints on, on what presidents can do. But as Gene said, presidents are often doing these things unilaterally, they just do them, right? And that's the problem uh, that we all face in uh, having a presidency that would seem to be too powerful and too unilateral when it comes to war making. Yeah. When you look back and see all the trouble this nation has gotten into because of that. And uh, then taking it to Eugene Healy, I guess the narrowly focused question that you could respond to or speak more broadly about it is, do you see a way in which this enhanced fast track authority could worsen the situation with respect to the president's exercise of war powers? What's absolutely. absolutely. Uh, well, uh, most presidents, it is true that the presidents have uh, a largely free hand in military affairs, a de facto, if not you know, uh, by any constitutional metric, uh, but they would, in general, since Cor since Korea, uh, they've preferred to get Congress on board if they're going to do a large land invasion uh, of a country like Iraq. Uh, so that's what, or Afghanistan. That's why you see uh, George W. Bush going for those, uh, uh, going for congressional authorization of some sort in those kinds of situations. That's basically been the war powers dynamic since Korea. Um, I think the fast track proposal gives them in a crisis atmosphere like uh, something like September 11th, um, the ability to uh, put their preferred language in front of Congress uh, immediately after the fact, rubber stamp it or say no to this injury that's been dealt us. And I think they're in a better position. Uh, I think they, I think uh, Fast Track does nothing to, uh, to change the, the basic dynamic that we've had since Korea um, and uh, possibly gives them another tool that in crisis situations could be very dangerous. But they're still going to have the choice, as they would with legislation, of uh, how do they feel about it? Do I want to use my unilateral? It does nothing about their unilateral powers. Uh, how do I feel about it? Do I want to use my unilateral military powers that I'm claiming or uh, get Congress uh, to buy in? And uh, so I, I think it does little to get rid of the problem uh, and, uh, you know, I, I potentially a lot to make it worse. Oh, that concludes the Q&A portion of uh, the evening. We now go to the summations. You each are going to be given a full seven and a half minutes uh, to summarize. And uh, you are the affirmative, Terry. So you go first. Uh, take it away, Terry. Just to sum up a few things. I didn't write out a, a formal statement uh, completely. But here are a few basic points um, that I just want to drive home. Um, we have a government that doesn't work. Now, and Congress is at the heart of the dysfunction. It has two houses, it has 535 members. They're tied to different states and districts. And as an institution, it's just filled with veto points and collective action problems that make any sort of action very difficult. And even when it can act, it cobbles together bills that are patchwork creations that are filled with special interest divisions and designed to get enough votes to pass, not to provide coherent, well-justified policies that are finely tuned to actually solve the nation's problems effectively. This is just unacceptable. It really is. The problems that we're facing as a modern nation get more and more complicated and more and more debilitating, you know? And if we can't solve these problems, they're gonna tear this society apart. And they're also gonna convince people that this government doesn't deserve to be supported. So because of our government effectiveness, these problems are destroying our quality of life. And this same ineffectiveness is also dangerous for our democracy because a government that can't meet the needs of its people 
gives rise to alienation and anger, to populism, and to a rejection of democracy itself. It's already happening. It's been happening throughout the Trump years. That's what gave rise to the Trump presidency. And it threatens to bring our down our democracy. Trump threatened to bring down our democracy. We need to do something. Fast track is one way of getting to the heart of the matter and trying to make our government work. It's a very conservative reform. You know, it's small. It's well tested for over four decades. Five minutes. Go ahead. And it leaves the rest of the government fully intact. It deserves our support, I think. So, um, so Gene has lobbed a, a number of different points up there. And um, to me, they don't add up to a coherent whole, a coherent counter argument. You know, he knows he doesn't like uh, fast track. Um, but there's not a coherent, persuasive argument. Why? Um, so um, it's a little hard to just pick out specific things um, uh, and argue against them. Um, so let me try to pick out just a few. Um, you know, so, so Jimmy Carter again. You know, Jimmy Carter desperately wanted a strong legacy. He wanted to be regarded as a great president like everybody else. Um, and what Gene points out is that, well, he did really important things, but he didn't get credit for them. You know, and that's true. But so what? You know, what's important here is we want to know what motivates presidents. And especially we want to know what motivates them by comparison to what motivates members of Congress. Members of Congress are not sitting around thinking of how they can come up with solutions to the nation's problems and how to make them the most effective possible. That's not the way members of Congress work. You know, they're thinking about soybeans or something small, something local, something parochial, something that'll get them reelected. Presidents have to be thinking big about these things. That's the big difference between presidents and members of Congress, and that's why we need presidents so much in the legislative process to make the legislative process work, right? And like with Carter, okay, he did some good things, but in the end, the economy was horrible, the Iranians took our hostages, and that's what mainly determined his legacy. Those things took him down because they were part of his legacy. There were good parts and there were bad parts and the bad parts dragged him down. Think about Lyndon Johnson. She, what he accomplished, you know, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, unbelievable, you know, the, the, the great society programs. But he also got us into Vietnam. Okay, what's his legacy? Well, at the end of the day, people said, getting us into Vietnam was so bad that Johnson has a bad legacy, even though his domestic legacy probably went way beyond FDRs, right? So legacy is not a simple thing. Presidents are striving for it, right? It just about killed Lyndon Johnson that he got tainted by this Vietnam War, right? But the important thing from our standpoint is that legacy drives presidents and legacy gives us a way to understand why presidents do what they do. It gives us a way to help predict their decisions and to know that presidents will behave differently from legislators. And if we want to have an effective government, we're much better off in the hands of presidents than we are in the hands of 535 legislators, right, who will put together bills that will not solve social problems. They have One a minute. long history of that. One minute, yeah. Yeah. Presidents want to solve social problems. We're in better hands with them. And so that's why this simple shift to fast track is a, is a reasonable way of trying to move us along this path toward a more effective government while leaving the whole rest of the government the same. Right. So that's that's the basic argument. And you can pick away at it and, and you know, complain about one aspect or another. But I think. 
what it often comes down to is, yeah, well, what are the ideas on the other side? You're going to leave everything the way it is? Good luck with that. What are the other ideas for making the government more effective? Let's hear them, right? I think fast track is an excellent idea. It's simple, it's easy to do, and it works. Thank you, Terry. Uh, yep. Gene Healy, your summation, seven and a half minutes. Uh, take it away, Gene Healy. With uh, apologies to yes, Minister, uh, Terry said we need to do something. Maybe we do. Fast track is something, but it shouldn't be done. Uh, it doesn't respond to any of the problems, most of the problems that, that he's identified. Um, he, uh, uh, well, let's look at, uh, I thought we would have gotten to this, but I guess we didn't. But uh, as I was preparing for this, uh, I thought about uh, COVID. I mean, it's certainly right. Government is ineffective. Uh, the, uh, the last year or so was a stress test for American, uh, the, the federal government. And uh, it certainly didn't perform well. Uh, you know, we've got a higher death rate than mo most of Europe. It's amazing to me that we're vaccinating faster than most of Europe, uh, given how uh, horrible and inefficient the vaccination process looks like uh, from, from the ground level. Um, but how many of our problems with COVID uh, were due to uh, veto points impeding bold legislative action? How many of our problems uh, in the big ticket items that have passed in the 21st century, the uh, uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan war authorizations, the bank bailouts and on and on were due to congressional, the problems stem from congressional parochialism and uh, log rolling. Uh, you know, Terry doesn't like Linguini. He does, certainly doesn't like watching sausage being made. But uh, in throughout the course of this century, uh, when Congress has done big things, it doesn't seem to me that what spoiled them was uh, congressional parochialism. And during the immediate crisis, there are a lot of veto points. There are a lot of veto players. They're not the ones that uh, Terry talks about or that uh, his proposal would do anything about. Uh, a lot of them in this current crisis were the, in the executive branch. The FDA and the CDC holding up early testing. The CDC holding up uh, testing in February of last year, uh, you know, when testing had already been developed in WHO in Germany, not allowing it to be approved because the CDC wanted their own test. Uh, you know, we lost two months in the pandemic there. Uh, we lost uh, at least a couple of months uh, in vaccine approval with the, uh, with the FDA dragging its feet and not working weekends and not treating this like an emergency situation, even though they eventually gave emergency authorization to a few of the vaccines. There are a lot of veto players, a lot of veto points uh, that uh, contribute to making American government woefully ineffective uh, and may even uh, add to the general ambiance that uh, makes people angry and, uh, uh, you know, willing to be anti-system players. But most of them, as far as I can tell, are not in Congress. I, uh, I, I hold no particular brief from Congress other than a constitutional one. Yeah, okay. uh, four, but, four uh, you know, I don't. Yeah. 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 OK, I, I, I uh, you know, I don't want to. Uh, be seen as carrying water for Congress other than its uh, constitutional role. Uh, there was a, uh, some years back, a bunch of uh, smart ass pollsters did a poll that uh, I quite liked where they, uh, they asked people uh, to rank Congress against uh, various unpleasant things like, uh, I think it was lice, colonoscopies and Nickelback. And uh, all of these unpleasant things beat Congress. Um, you know, Congress uh, deserves uh, in many ways the lack of respect that it gets. But it does not seem to me, other than fairly indirectly, uh, it has been respond the lack of fast track uh, authority and uh, the filibuster and uh, 
the uh, the 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 power of the House and Senate leadership has been what has made this pandemic such a disaster for Americans. Uh, it, you know, it, it's uh, executive branch players in uh, the administrative state and in some cases in the state house, governor's office. Um, and so while I think uh, government should be more effective, I would like government to be more effective in the things that it should le legitimately be doing. I see nothing that, uh, in particular that Fast Track would do to end this general sense of government ineffectiveness. And I see at least a few things it could do to uh, you know, grease the, the wheels for, uh, for more disasters along the lines that we had after 9-11 and during the financial crisis. And uh, well, I guess I, I guess I'll leave it there. Uh, you, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Gene Healy. Uh, and that concludes our debate. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Gene. It looks like we got the voting results. In summary, it was pretty close. Again, whoever wins uh, is sort of quote unquote wins and gets the Tootsie Roll is the one who moves the needle in his favor. The yes vote initially uh, on behalf of the resolution defended by Terry Moe was 4.55%. And Terry, you gained nine percentage points. You moved up to 13.6%. A gain of nine percentage points is the number to beat. Uh, uh, Gene Healy's uh, defending the no side went from 63.6 to 77.2, picking up 13.6 points. So 13.6 exceeds the nine that you gained. Uh, Gene, you're looking perplexed that you you got 13 percentage points gain, and uh, and uh, Terry got a nine percentage point gain. So you had a four percentage point margin of victory. Gene Healy. You get the Tootsie Roll. Congratulations to Terry. Congratulations to Gene. Thank you very much for a superb debate, and we hope to see you all soon uh, at the Soul Forum. Good night. Good night.